do a bit of review. Does anybody want to share that? You remember I had you take a rock that appealed to you or that was speaking to you? And the devotions, did anybody spend any time with those devotions? Did you? Awesome. So, um, do you want to share any, not what you devoted, but just, um, well, I found the question interesting because um, um, a lot of the phrases were not that I would be able to, you know, um, what actions or words reveal my faith to be less firm or more or enduring? And it's like, it's like, well, I don't know how my words come across to others. Oh, well, that in itself is a is a good introspective self-awareness, right? Yeah. And um, then there was spiritual insight or spiritual insensitivity. I mean, I couldn't figure out where I was supposed to go with all that. Yeah, I thought those were um, different words yes. for a spiritual, uh -huh. uh, for a devotion. Yeah. yeah. Insensitivities, you know, that could be towards ourselves, toward others, toward God. So um, I had to sit with that word a bit too. Mm -hmm. But the more I thought about it, I thought, yeah, I mean, I that would that was a challenging word for yep. me as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? I, I'm not putting you on the spot. That's I'm just okay. grateful for what you shared. I know when I picked out the rock, they were all ugly rocks. So I picked out a smooth one and I figured I could throw it down the river. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. Right. Yeah. Now, you thought they were all ugly, huh? Well, yeah, look, there's not much color to them. It's deformed. It's not smooth on anything. Mm -hmm. And I thought, isn't that like life? Yeah. I saw that rock and I thought, boy, that looks like life. And, and it's like me. Okay. We, we all feel that we're not perfect. Perfect. Yeah. We may have little notches in us from scars we had before. Or bulges. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't want to say it. I'll say but it. But it's like, what I got. how much work would it take to make it smooth? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It would take a whole lot of time to make this thing. And many times it was on my, my desk thing there, and I thought, is that a piece of brick? <laughs> <laughs> Just glancing, oh, did I miss something? That, you know, it doesn't look like, look like one of those little potatoes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. finger <laughs> And so yeah. It, was, it was interesting to look at the rock. Would anybody else have comments about your rock? Well, Mark said his was ugly. He was going to skip it down the river. Oh, well, and I picked that one because it wasn't so ugly. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you for sharing. It's just always, you know, um, maybe keep it on your dresser or where you yes. do your prayer or whatever uh -huh. as some kind of icon for you sure. to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for sharing. So today we're going to talk about Mary and Martha. A good question for us to open up our thoughts about them, be looking at that, and I'm just going to uh, offer a brief prayer while you're doing that. Gracious God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father, we give thanks for the intersecting and intertwined relationships we experience in our own family. We also thank you for the record of your word through which we have the opportunity to experience fresh insights through old and familiar stories. Surprise us with glimpses of complex personalities where we may have only seen one-dimensional characters or more. Open our eyes to what you have to teach us about being disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, uh, the story of Mary and Martha, um, it's one of the few stories where women are lifted up in the Bible, but we have this drama going on. There's actually a storyline and we get to see the characters of Mary and Martha and Jesus. Lazarus doesn't say much, you know, especially in the next part, <laughs> but he has the last laugh, right? So we're going to talk about uh, Mary and Martha and we're going to read just a little bit 
Uh, how many of you think it is possible to be Mary and Martha? I mean, would you both? agree with that? What was that? That we are both Mary and Martha. Mm -hmm. In time. the story. Yes. I think at times. Yes. You know, on some days, I'm more like Mary. Uh, most other days, I'm more like Martha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I'd rather be doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm watching probably, you know, older sister. Okay. I, that's how I figure, you know, older sister telling everybody what to do, when to do it. You know? Okay. Um, yeah. That kind of thing. So it's but assumed Martha is older. Uh, uh, according according to what I read, yeah, yeah she is. Yeah, old. yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. So I thought that made total sense. Yeah. Because then, then you understand why she's the one that's worried about preparing a meal, worried about, you know, I mean, um, yeah, being the older one. That's those are your words. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she was living into her role. Right. Yeah. Right. The responsible yeah. one. The responsible one. Yeah. 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 You should have heard my sister on problems of being the eldest. Really? <laughs> because yeah. of the responsibility and the yeah, responsibility. expectation? Well, sort of breaking trail, breaking our parents in mm. to what to expect and what not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have an older As a teenager? Going into being a first teenager? Yes. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. My sister's 15 months older than me, and um, she did great path for me. Yeah. So I got away with a lot more than she did. And she was more responsible and I think still is to this day. But um, well, I appreciate her wisdom. Um, okay, let's look at Bethany Refuge in the handout that I gave you. And we're going to just, um, we're going to read a little bit about them. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time reading. But um, as we listen to this, this section of our reading this morning, just be thinking about some things that maybe we could add then uh, about Mary and Martha. And we're going to do that a couple of different ways. So the Beth Bethany Refuge is on page one of the handout I gave you. And it's very short, so we're just going to read this. If someone's willing to take that first paragraph and then the second paragraph, um, I think it's just three paragraphs. So, um, yeah. Oh, thank you. Does somebody want to start there? Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived in the village of Bethany, which was less than two miles from Jerusalem. After Jesus drove the money changers from the temple, he went out of the city to Bethany and spent the night there. The references to Jesus' affection for the family gives us the impression that he found a quality of friendship and nurture in their home that sustained him. That is probably appropriate to make their home was a place of solace during the week that culminated in Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion. I sense that these three friends gave me the purest gift of friendship, expecting no benefit in return. Unlike the disciples who, for all their earnestness, envisioned themselves as someday having a place of leadership in the kingdom they expected Jesus to develop. It seems likely that Martha was the older of the two girls, perhaps the matriarch of family. It is easy, in fact, to think of Lazarus as the younger brother, beloved, beloved of both sisters, essential to both as man of the family household. When Luke tells the story of the family, he says that a woman named Martha welcomed Jesus into her home and that she had a sister named Mary. Perhaps Martha was financially self-sufficient widow, maintaining a household for her siblings. In any event, she was surely the one in charge. The New Testament gives us two major stories about the sisters, and their respective characters come through quite clearly in their responses to Jesus. I suspect that different ones of us will favor one woman over the other, but in truth, each demonstrates admir admirable 
virtues and each shows some human weakness. And this is at least partly because our strengths so often carry with them a commensurate weakness or at least a peril to be dealt with. Okay. So keeping that in mind, I am going to read Luke 10, 38 to 42. This is the dinner party. And then I'm going to read it twice. The first time I read it after I'm done, you're going to give me the qualities you see in Mary. I'll read it again, and then you can share with me what you think are some of the qualities that we find in Martha. So reading from Luke 10, 38 to 42. Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. So, what do you see in Mary in that reading? Devotion. Devotion. Okay. What else? Listener? Listening? Okay. Inquiring, I think. Inquiring? Okay. She kind of expected to learn something. Okay. <laughs> Martha probably thought she was lazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Remember that they've been living together for many, many years. I think I don't I don't think uh, the impression at this dinner party would probably have made a whole lot of difference. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was probably just the same thing being lived out between the two of them? Okay. Okay, so a familiar pattern, can I say it that way? Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think so she was probably the quieter one. Mary? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so... Anything else? Okay, now I'm going to read it, and you are going to then share some of your impressions of Martha. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. So what did you learn about Martha? Responsible hostess. She's responsible hostess, right. She kind of given up on uh, scolding Mary herself since she asked for Jesus to do that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she asked Jesus to intervene, right? Yes. That is the part that sounded oddest to me. What does Jesus do, by the way? We could have him up here, too. Uh, outgoingly assertive. She's assertive, yeah. Outgoing and assertive. And my guess is she was a wealthy woman because remember that scene in Lazarus where he died and they have the professional mourners there. You paid people to come and cry and moan and groan and she was able to afford that. So anything else about Martha? Uh, she, she was used to running the show, I think. Yeah, I... So, I and taking, uh, probably the social part of, you know, making sure that things went well. Except for bossing Martha, Mary around. A lot of, of self-confidence. 
self-confidence, right? Uh -huh. Because really, um, she really, do you think she's bold in her asking Jesus to intervene? Sure. <laughs> I think she's reached a point where she couldn't get Mary to listen on her own. So boy, she was going to go that someone she felt had authority. <laughs> yeah. Little did she know. Huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, but I'd say, you know, Mary might have been the, you know, the, the younger sister, the one that never married. Maybe she wasn't as attractive. She had less self-confidence. She was probably the mouse. Mm -hmm. that, I, I kind of thought about that. Mm -hmm. Somebody who, who, you know, kind of hides more than, uh, I don't know. Yeah. But again, with, uh, with Martha running the show all the time, she's more or less in the background mm -hmm. and let her run the show. Mm -hmm. And now when Jesus was there, like, Martha was going to make sure everything was run good, but then she got a little bit frustrated mm -hmm. and wanted some help, but she didn't go about it right now. Yeah, I remember I would ask my daughter Abby to clean her room, and I'd go up and clean it after she cleaned it, you know. Yeah. So maybe Abby just thought, what the heck, you know. And yes, it showed. <laughs> yeah. So I was struck by um, this word. She was distracted, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. What, mm -hmm. what does that say? I mean, what do you what do you read into that word distracted? Um, I think to me it's just she wanted everything to be perfect. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. She just <laughs> ask Jim when we're having guests. The I devil's just, in the detail. Oh, right? I'm just I'm just a nervous wreck. Yeah, I want it to be. Yes. Yeah. 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 So and Jesus of all people. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I can see well, what Martha's <laughs> doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And if we can put it into context where, you know, Jesus, he, he chides her a bit, doesn't mm -hmm. he? Yeah. Martha, Martha, you know, the, the one real thing, you, you know, you're overlooking. And, you know, think of Jesus, where he's come from. What did it say? He's just turned the tables over in the temple. Mm -hmm. So we know that that was a sign of anger. We know Jesus was angry in that incident. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, you know, he's looking for a meal, going to relax a little bit, and somebody asked him to step into a family wobble or whatever you want to call it. So, yeah. I think Martha was the older sibling. Yeah. Yes, she was. Yeah. 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 That solves that, doesn't it? Yeah. She very much behaved like that. So, um, any of different impressions that you have of either one of them? Anything new in that story for you? Any surprises? Well, I'm surprised that lots of Russell wasn't involved. Yeah. <laughs> he was Maybe he was, maybe uh, he was uh, on uh, uh, Maybe he was out of town. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I think, yeah. But um, I know in my family, anything to do with the household, I had to do. Mm. Okay. Sadly enough, I also had to help with the outside stuff. Oh. And my brothers never had to help with dishes or set the table or any of that. Okay. So I can see where Martha gets frustrated mm -hmm. yeah. because they don't help. That wasn't their role, quote, according to my dad. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Lazarus may just thought I'll come in and made it out scared <laughs> from his previous experience right. with the family dynamics, right? So, um, yeah, well, okay, well, Martha, we're going to see a different side of Martha here because, you know, um, last week we talked about Peter, right, where he says to Jesus, where Jesus says, who do you think that I am? And so keeping that in mind, we are going to uh, read how Martha reacts in uh, the next part. We're going to look at John 11, 1 through 16. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. 
Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through him. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus, after her, having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and you were going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble uh, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our, Lazar our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciple said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was, that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called a twin, said to his fellow, fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Okay. So, in light of that, um, what happens first? Lazarus gets sick, and the sisters send for help. Yeah. And what else? What else do you notice? Anything else? That Jesus is in a hurry. He's not in a hurry. In I fact, he, this is a plan. This is this mm -hmm. is what he plans to do. He's allowing mm -hmm. Lazarus to die so that uh, he can perform a miracle, so yes. that people will better understand what he's trying to mm -hmm. trying to do. And he's waited four days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in Jewish tradition, the soul leaves the body after three. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And maybe very intentional. Right. Okay. So, we're setting up the scene there. Um, you know that Lazarus has died. And we're going to move next then to 11, 17 to 27. And I would like a narrator and a Jesus and a Martha. So, who would like to read the part of Jesus? Can I know? ask a question back yes. on the other part? Yes. It says, um, after Jesus got through this, he said, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. Mm -hmm. He didn't say he died. Yeah. So it's interesting that he didn't, that wasn't the, the description. Yeah. Yeah. He died later. Well, right. Yeah. But right. right away he doesn't, you know, get, okay, go on. <laughs> yeah. But I'm going there to awaken him. Mm -hmm. To awaken yeah. him. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, I need a Jesus for 17 to 27. I'll be the narrator. Okay. <laughs> How about uh, Martha? All right. Does anybody want to be Jesus? What? I'll be Martha. I, I think we have a Martha, Martha, don't we? Oh, we have a narrator. Martha. You're Martha. Okay. You're Martha and Jesus. Come on, Jim. Okay. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, 
I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, and the one coming into the world. Okay, so we've got now coming from Martha. And where is Mary during this, by the way? She left the home. She stayed home. So we have now Mary. It's kind of a role reversal. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, we see a role reversal here. And I'm just going to read you quickly Matthew 16, verse 16. And then we're going to talk about Peter and Martha. So 16, 16 says, Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And so does that sound familiar to what Martha says to Jesus? Yeah. Okay, so... Um, See, I don't think that sounds like Mary at all. Mary doesn't say anything. <laughs> I mean, she's really quiet. She might be listening. Mm -hmm. She might be, you know, devoted. Mm -hmm. But but Martha's the one that, you know, talks, talks, <laughs> and, and and is is um, you know, she must get herself confidence from her faith also. Well, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's like, oh, come on, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. You know, I can, you know, and because maybe they were, it was a, a household where they were friends, that's what it sounded like. Well, yes, mm -hmm. and she says, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died, but even now, I know that God will give you whatever <laughs> you <laughs> ask of him. See? Yeah. That's a powerful <laughs> foretelling of her faith, you know, not only in what's happened, but what might happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're seeing this incredible faith that Martha has. Um, you know, Peter, who spent all this time with Jesus, says something almost verbatim. Mm -hmm. So if Peter's confession is a mark of discipleship, what about Martha's? Is she a disciple? Sure. I think Not she officially. is. Yeah. And um, she knows Jesus. We know that. She knows him as a person as well as, you know, a prophet and a healer. And Jesus' words that he's the Son of God. So, um, yes, I think she qualifies as a disciple. Um, but, you know, we've got those roadblocks of the patriarchal system mm -hmm. and all of that. And we're going to talk about Mary at the tomb. Well, if it's a patriarchal, then this is all out of whack because Martha, being the oldest, like many people, let the oldest take charge in a situation like that where the other ones say, I will respect the elder. Mm -hmm. So Lazarus was way down the line here, mm -hmm. but we never hear from him. We don't. And let's like, what happened to him? I mean, after he didn't give witness in the other things, mm -hmm. so now Martha takes over, mm -hmm. and he is that leader yes. that we would expect someone else to be. Right. So we don't know if there are other relatives that could have handled this. Mm -hmm. Or if Mary and Martha's family was well, you know, dispersed around the area. Or it may have just been the three of them. That's true. Yeah. But Martha clearly expects something like a, 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 a revival to happen. I don't know mm -hmm. what the right word is. Yeah. The right. <laughs> Resuscitation. Resuscitation. Yep. That's, yeah. okay. That's the word mm -hmm. I was yeah. looking for. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. maybe harkens back to, well, he's asleep. Mm -hmm. You know. So... But there's a whole lot of metaphor and symbolism in the story mm -hmm. of Lazarus. One of my favorite stories, especially where Jesus says, unbind him and let him go. That liberation of all the, you know, the uh, wrappings around him. It just, uh, it's just a powerful story. But so Martha, Martha certainly gets it, right? And she has the courage to say that to Jesus. She goes out at first and kind of snipes at him. If you had been here, 
my brother wouldn't have died. There's a certain reproach in that. Yes, yes, there is a certain reproach, but we've seen her do it before with Jesus, right? <laughs> Maybe not a reproach, but a confrontation with him about what are you going to do with this sister of mine? So. Um, and he didn't have to be there to begin with. Jesus? Yeah. No. To raise him. No, no, no. So, um, you know, they sent out word Jesus, you know, and he waits four days and then he comes. So yeah, he just does do some uh, resuscitation, there we go, uh, remotely. I mean, he doesn't. Uh, a servant somewhere who dies that yeah. doesn't even get close to. Right, right, yeah, yeah. It's probably something that Martha might have had in mind. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there were stories about that. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the Gospel of John draws on different sources and also um, portrays Jesus as, as approachable and personable and a man and the Son of God. You know, with these conversations he has with people, we learn a lot about Jesus. So, you know, it's, it's, it's um, illuminating for us, too, to see how Jesus responds with this family. You know, it's that shortest verse in the Bible where Jesus weeps mm -hmm. over the death of Lazarus because he was a friend. Mm -hmm. So we see that side of Jesus as well. What well. is the connection between that family, though? It, uh, it seems like they're awful close to Jesus. Yes. And, uh, but uh, I don't get the connection that there was. It brought them together. Um... We don't know. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't really go into that. That, But we know that Jesus was, I'm sure, high on the list of dinner guests for yeah. people to invite. And he did spend a lot of time with the hospitality of meal. We know that, you know. He did a lot of his ministry around a table, which goes to the next question. The role of table service in biblical times proscribed. That means the women did it, right? And, and the servants. So is this still true today? For the most part, but the men do the dishes. And you know, yeah, and I don't know if you have sons-in-laws, but my son-in-law is a great cook, and he cooks often, you know, and so I think that... You know, we've come a long, long way in Martha table service, that's where the word uh, diaconia comes from, that hospitality of waiting and service for people. And, you know, um, we have deacon, deacons in uh, the book of Acts, women deacons, deaconesses we would call them, I guess. Um, and so, um, but table service in biblical times was done by women. Um, what about churches? Who does the table service? Oh. I brought <laughs> sweeping generalizations. What do we call those people that set the table in the church. United Sisters. United Sisters. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, whatever the group is, you know, um, it is the ones that are the worker bees for the most part in terms of meal. What about the meal that takes place in the sanctuary? Half and half. Mm -hmm. Half and half. Your altar guild is half and half? Oh, no, no. I was thinking about the... Um, lay lay ministers. ministers. Okay, yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, no, pretty, pretty half and half. But who sets that table? Do you have w men in your altar guild? That no, pair? no, the men don't no. set the table. Okay. It's the lay minister sets right. the table. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, the cleanup is done by more the sisters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. There were a few men. I don't know if they're still on it. No. Mm -hmm. Well, so, but we are making strides, correct? And if you look at it from the opposite way, when I was in confirmation, uh, years and years and years ago now, um, we couldn't acolyte. Girls couldn't acolyte. Right. Mm -hmm. I never acolyte. That's you why know, I don't like to do it now. Yeah. Well, you know, I remember my brother was sort of the fault acolyte. He was always the one that got called when someone didn't show up. But well, You know, if you go back in the, in the farming community times, uh, always you know, threshing and all that, the women were always the cook. Mm -hmm. They run the whole show. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. that, that part goes back. Actually, a bit of, bit of, bit of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, there is a bit of a shift, but a lot of that, you know, is uh, true today. 
So now we're going to read one of my favorite stories from John 12, 1 through 8. So I'd like you to turn to that. And we have Mary again. And this time she's just I want you to be thinking about boundaries here because she is just, you know, they're blowing them to bits, the boundaries in this uh, story. So to some, it's only eight verses. So if someone would like to read that whole thing, there's lots to talk about here. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a palm of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. But Jesus Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with, me, with you, but you do not always have me. Okay, so there's all kinds of stuff going on in here. Okay. In just these three mm-hmm. verses, we know that Jesus is back at Bethany. Lazarus has been raised from the dead. Who's serving again? Martha. Martha Martha. is true to four. She's serving. And here again, here comes Mary. Now, um, where is she again? At Jesus' feet. She's at the feet of Jesus again. But this time, what does she do with her devotion? She anoints his feet. With her Hair. dries them with her That's hair. Right. Women never let their hair down in public in biblical times. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so she lets her hair down. Chances are Mary is serving, or Martha is serving. Mary is at the feet of Jesus, but there most likely were no other women in that room. Mm-hmm. And it could very well be that Martha isn't mm-hmm. in that room. Mm-hmm. So Mary is the only one. You know, she presents herself in a room full of men, lets down her hair, and then puts this costly perfume on Jesus' feet. So it's a powerful, powerful um, expression of the bounds of social boundaries that she's stepping all over the place on. Um, Was she a hussy? Pardon? Was she a hussy? Um, We don't hear that, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, Some people speculate. You know, but um, the writer of a lesson calls it an act of luxurious worship. Mm-hmm. So, for one thing, this costs a lot of money. Which Martha probably earned. Which what? Which Martha probably earned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but isn't it interesting right. who's commenting on that? Who lifts it up? Why are you doing this? You could be feeding the poor. Yeah. Judas, yes. Judas, who's stealing from the purse. Well, at least that's what John says. I, I don't know how John knew about the, knew this. I, I tend to think that verse is... Was, I think <clears throat> it's sort of after the fact. Uh, yeah, oh, I, yeah. <laughs> John was written after... They all, all the Gospels were written mm-hmm. after the right. fact. But they, I mean... I don't think he had proof. No. I think what he, what was going on was that at this point, Judas was really the bad guy, mm-hmm. and so they're John making it worse. Just, yeah, <laughs> they're John, making it worse. John doesn't John doesn't want to say anything good about uh, no. Judas. No, but it, but but you know, it, in a sense, I I agree with what you're saying, but it's a moot point because mm-hmm. Jesus knows already what Judas, Judas is going to yeah. do. So. Uh, but I agree with you. Um, and John took liberties. All let's be honest. All of the authors of the Gospels had a different, you know, theme that they were lifting up in their Gospels. So, um, you know, John again is about this getting into the, you know, who Jesus was as person and son of God. So yeah, I mean, there there probably were uh, sexual connotations that were going on as well. This is a very intimate scene mm-hmm. that you know Mary is letting down her hair. 
you know, touching feet, although that was traditional there. But you don't know how we do um, in churches I've been in that on Monday, Thursday, when we ask people if they're willing to have their feet washed, nobody wants to do that. No. That's a very intimate thing, really, right. when you think about something. You know, feet aren't that great looking, and you know they're all different yeah. in their own way, but people avoid that. She's also using this oil that was traditionally used at for burial. burial. For burial for burial. So again, this is setting up the scene of Jesus' death mm -hmm. and how, you know, Nicodemus was there and other people to um, prepare his body for burial. Uh, just a comment in that, uh, well, washing of feet, that's humbling for both. Yes, yes. The Servants, first. yes. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. Jesus would go on and do that, right? Mm -hmm. With the disciples. Mm -hmm. And Peter says, nah, you're not going to wash my feet. You know, wash my, the rest of me. But, you know, again, oh, feet only, but also my hands and my head. My hands and my head. I, my feeling on that one was that if, Peter wanted a part, wanted to, what was it? If I do not wash your feet, you have no part in me. Mm -hmm. Well, Peter wanted the part in me part. Yes. And he was saying, well, tell me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I, I think, you know, what do you see in Jesus' feet washing? What, what do you see in that? And in Mary's washing of Jesus' feet. I mean, that's considered worship. Um, Jesus certainly wasn't worshiping the disciples, do you think? Mm -hmm. oh, no. Servant. Uh, the servant. Servant. Yeah. 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 He showed, he wanted to show there was nothing beneath him. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be nothing beneath us to help another person to get whatever he Yeah. The beauty of Jesus, Jesus never asked anybody to do anything that Jesus did not do right. himself. If I, your Lord and teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have set you an example. Yeah. Yeah. The servants are not greater than their masters. Yeah. Yeah. So, what else do you notice anything going on here for the first time? You know, we really have seen both sides of Martha, right? Mm -hmm. We've seen her faith and her role as servant as well. She's serving during this meal and this encounter with Mary. Mary is true to her behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Only this time, she's a little more bold. Wouldn't right. you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did she have an idea of what was coming? You know, you spend a lot of time watching what's going on rather than being distracted. You learn a lot that way too, don't right. you? Right. So yeah, I'm not going to disagree with you. I think that's part of that mystery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're going to see a different side of Mary when she comes to the tomb. Then we're going to see um, a little bit different side of her. So um, let's Look at the conclusion here on your sheet. It's on page four. Do you want to read that? The conclusion? Yeah, um, two paragraphs. Okay. So here are our sisters, Martha and Mary. Their names constitute an inseparable duet. They were dramatically, sometimes humorously, different in their basic personalities, but they were identical in their commitment to their Lord. One did not love Jesus more than the other, but each loved him in her own way. Martha missed the blessing of the pre-meal conversation, but she made them messianic declarations. Mary appointed Jesus' feet, anointed Jesus' feet while Martha served him his meal. I won't choose between them. I would like to be Martha, but taking time to listen carefully to my Lord. And I would like to be Mary, but also picking up the dishes in the Master's honor after the meal is over. Perhaps while Martha is now sitting at Jesus' feet. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, it really is, it really isn't even fair. I, I'm speaking personally here to try and separate who's better or who's worse or who loved Jesus more or, you know, both of these women um, were disciples. Uh, Mary is considered the first apostle, if you look at that story at the tomb, because Peter and John go to the tomb, they're afraid to go in, mm -hmm. and then they go home after they've been told that Jesus has been resurrected. Who goes and tells everybody? It's Mary. It's Mary. I'll never forget, we had a sister, Sister Marilyn, come to adult ed. I was responsible for that one, too, but it's church, I was Chris Ed director. And she's reading, and one of the other older pastors had come in because she was Catholic, and he wanted to make sure that everything she said at adult ed was proper. Mm -hmm. So he's sitting in the back, and she's reading that story, and she said, so it would seem to me that uh, Mary is the first apostle. And she just quietly looks up and looks down again and goes on. And, you know, there was kind of a dead face. And I always wondered what, you know, well, I asked Pastor Meyer afterwards. He said, I thought she did a great job. So, you know, it's things that we typically don't think of with women in biblical times who really, um, you know, are on the forefront at times in discipleship. And, you know, especially in the book of Acts, which is where the rubber hits the road. So, um, yeah. So, how do we honor differences to build up the body of Christ? Those various roles and expressions of discipleship. You know, how does, what does Paul talk about when he speaks about the body of Christ? He uses the image of a what? A body, right? Mm -hmm. How does the eye not know what the ear is doing or the arm doesn't know what the leg is doing? You know, he uses that huge metaphor to describe the body of Christ. So, um, how do we honor those differences? Think of all the people you know in this church that may not necessarily do things the way you would do them, right? But ultimately, you know, if you step back and look at the big picture in a church, um, it's a team. Mm -hmm. It is a team. Yeah. It is a team. And the size of your congregation is family size. Mm -hmm. So most families are dysfunctional, aren't they? Oh. Yes, in one way or another. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we could all share stories. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah. So, yeah. I think we honor the differences. That doesn't mean we, we, you know, do things maybe that are above and beyond, you know, you know, you have boundaries. We all have boundaries. So I think of the different boards in the church. Church properties, they handle something I couldn't even do. Right. Um, the teachers, things that I don't care to do. Yeah. I mean, it just goes so then maybe they don't cook, mm -hmm. so we do that. So we all have something to add to this. Yes. And nothing is any better than anything else. Right. Yeah. Um, people see the outside, so they may be impressed by that, but if you look at our church, it's all what's inside the people. Yeah. Because we're what makes the cross Lutheran yeah. people work. I mean, and what happens to people who volunteer who are told how to do things differently? Or they, who are don't, they, they, they quit. Yeah, yeah they get the message. Mm -hmm. They get the message. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, this is, I'm sure, not what Mary, but just, and if a sense bothers you, you know, I encourage you to just pass that around. And what I'm going to do is just shut the lights off and I'm going to light this candle. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to read to you, and your instructions, we're going to read about that word, that those two words, luxurious worship. We're going to read John 12, 1 through 3. I'm going to read it four times. The first time I'm going to simply read it, then a word that stands out for you. I read it again. What in my life seems passage? And what might God be calling me to do? Okay? So, um, if you're not into this and you think it's, it's 
you know, not for you. You can check out mentally or spiritually, however you want, but um, it's just a different way of hearing scripture. It's very close to what we would call Lectio Divina. Anybody ever done that? Okay. You have? Somebody say yes? No. No. Okay. Okay. All right. The only thing I have to do is find the matches, because I know I brought them down here. There they are. I led a Bible study with a pastor, an interim pastor, where I was as a Chris Ed director called Companions in Christ. And when I left, it gave me this candle holder, and it's a beautiful expression of companion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm in Christ. So I think of them every time I haul it out. So a couple of moments of silence before I begin. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So the second time, a word that stands out for you. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And this time, what in my life seems connected to this passage? Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And this last question, what might God be calling me to do? Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, 
anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. How does our prayer life, our service, and our act of discipleship reflect our extravagant love of God? And whenever you're ready, we'll leave in quiet.